Hi guys, welcome again to another episode of Emancipated Human. My name is Luis, and uh, I have a, a pretty cool guest with me today. And I'll, just a little background story about maybe a year and a half ago, I went to Asheville, and I got in contact with the Blue Ridge Liberty Project. These guys are a group of uh, individuals, because we like that word, right? A group of individuals that um, are extremely active in the whole uh, idea of liberty, how we can live. Uh, and they're pretty inspirational. So after I went and met them, um, I stayed in touch with uh, one of my favorite people ever. Uh, and I say this because he's uh, very, very smart, extremely versed in uh, a lot of things. And just the way uh, he's able to speak about all these ideas to me was pretty impressive. So I've been privileged enough, and I should check my privilege, um, because he's been sending me chapters of his book. He's been writing a book that's, I'm not going to talk a lot about it, but there was one, I mean, everything blew my mind that he, you know, the way he was talking about it. But one thing, the poor, um, it just blew me away because, uh, you know, there is an idea that libertarians or anarchists hate the poor. That's why we want to get rid of the government because nobody will be able to take care of them. So more money for us, um, you know, greedy capitalists. So <laughs> Chase Rachels is no longer in Asheville, but he is in New Hampshire with um, the Free State Project. So would you like to introduce yourself a little bit and tell us uh, a little bit uh, about you and then we can hit the road on the uh, poor thing? Yeah, absolutely. Well, before we get into that, I just want to let you know that I am actually returning to Asheville in a couple weeks. So I've had my fill in the Free State Project, and it was a good experience, but I found that the Blue Ridge is more suitable for me. I'll be moving back there around uh, the mid to late July area. And a little bit about me, um, I started off, like a lot of us in this community, as a neoconservative I uh, joined the military right out of high school. I became an intelligence analyst with the Air Force. Uh, in this job, I got to see a, a very strategic view of our dealings in the world, our being the United States government, not mine or yours. <laughs> and it really helped open my eyes to a lot of the things that I was previously unaware of, namely that there are no good guys versus bad guys as far as governments go. It's bad guys versus bad guys, and who's just more effective, right? And uh, Bad versus this, worse. That's right. There you go. And in this arena, I discovered Ron Paul and uh, read a lot of his literature and work and uh, became very involved in the Constitution and, and general liberty ideas. And, you know, I just, as I read more and more, I began to develop my, my uh, own understanding, which eventually evolved to minarchism, which gave itself way to anarchism in the end. Um, that's kind of a quick progression of my uh, current state of affairs. Uh, once I became an anarchist, I met Justin Stout. Well, just prior to that, I met Justin Stout. And uh, we decided to start that organization called the Blue Ridge Liberty Project in Ash, North Carolina. And we really combined not just the anarchist ideas, but also some of the means we think are the most effective of getting there, which include peaceful parenting, uh, agorism, uh, really living the, living the lifestyle, living free and showing others how such a community could work as opposed to just kind of speaking it abstractly. But yet again, I do like the abstract theorizing. I'm an intellectual at heart. I love talking about this idea and spreading these ideas to others. So I guess we'll be doing it today, talking about the poor, which I'm very excited about to kind of try to vanquish some of these myths that are perpetrated by leftists and even conservatives as far as allegations against pure capitalists and uh, libertarians such as ourselves. So... Um, I'm very honored to do this with you on your show today. I'm very excited to be here. Thank you. Thank you for accepting, uh, you know, the invitation. I, I'm pretty excited about that. But, you know, I mean, we're filthy capitalists. Do we not, like, <laughs> hate the poor? Yes, indeed. Yeah, that's, that's certainly the narrative, right? Um, that is that uh, the greedy capitalist sits in his, his big leather armchair on the top of his little skyscraper while... The, the poor working class, they just toil away under his tutelage, just working long, crazy hours and horrible working conditions, you know. And because this has the tendency to occur, we need the, the state 
to come in and, and pass regulations and laws which set minimum standards for workplace safety and, and wage standards and, and, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, but it's, it's very interesting when I was uh, researching for my more recent chapters, like we just talked about, which is on the poor, it turns out that um, a lot of the improvements in the working conditions, a lot of the increases in wages, a lot of the increase just in the general uh, standard of living of society uh, came about through capitalism, th through the free markets, you know, and insofar as state measures kind of conflicted with what was already occurring under the marketplace, they actually impeded this process. Um, it's a very difficult argument to make, you know, especially had people talking about the Industrial Revolution and the horrid working conditions there, and they referenced child labor and sweatshops, and these are definitely concerns, but what they, what they failed to do is to really compare those environments with the environments that were previously available to these people. Instead of doing that, they compare them with the work environments we have today, which are only able to have because we we're able to accumulate the capital necessary to build more efficient means of production, which allowed workers to be more productive, which allowed employers to pay them more because they could do more with the same amount of inputs, which made uh, their lives better, made themselves more productive, allowed them to get more money. And, and the reason that these employers are incentivized to pay them more is not because they're nice guys, it's not because they're necessarily altruistic, but because if they don't, then their competitor will. You know, so that's the beauty of the free market is it takes our inherent self-interest as human beings. It doesn't require us to be good or altruistic or benevolent. It simply takes for granted that we're self-interested creatures and based off the uh, competitive mechanisms of the market, it, it makes it so that the only way for us to accrue wealth, empower ourselves, or influence, I should say, is to actually first give to society services and goods that they want. And that's the beauty of the market, that it harmonizes our self-interest with the interests of greater society. Whereas the statists, on the other hand, it would be ironic because they're the ones who truly have more of the, uh, how do you say, uh, paradoxical setup to where that they call us the idealist, yet they're the ones who require their people in authority to be benevolent and altruistic, you know, and, and forthcoming and clear when really they're humans just like the so called capitalists are. The only difference between them and the capitalists is they have the unique power to initiate force against others and their property, which makes them a much more dangerous threat. And this has been evidenced through history that. With these people in power, wealth is severely hampered, destroyed, stunted. People are much more exploited. And yes, there are some corporations who can exploit people indirectly, but they only do this through the state, through having access to its exactly. power. And that's the important key thing to really recognize here. I, I love that part because that's usually the overlooked part of it. Uh, you and I couldn't do that because right. we don't have that um, arm in the government. So, you know, another thing that a lot of people think that we, because we're, you know, anarchists, libertarians, we're, we're uh, heartless and, you know, mm -hmm. very cold. It's only because we're completely selfish and uh, all this stuff. But the funny part about that is that the vast majority of anarchists that I've encountered are like super, super amazing, super sweet, super gentle uh, and it's that idea of uh, voluntarism, voluntary interactions, peaceful interactions. So it's not that we're saying we're going to be cold and we're going to be heartless and I'm just paying you because otherwise you'll go with somebody else. I mean, that is, there is an element to that. But right. the, the, the other element is, you know, we, it's just the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. So if you're able, you would do it. Right. So I guess that's like the one caveat that a lot of people, you know, hey, well, yeah, but and the other part, you know, the, the fuzzy and warmth of government programs that are, you know, geared towards all this beautiful uh, cornucopia of money and resources ends up always in tears and people even dying. You know, you went to war. So all those kinds of things that are only uh, subsidized by taxation. So right. okay. um, would you like to tell us a little bit more about your research on uh, what you found about the, um, who really benefits by all these regulations? It's not really the poor, is it? 
Yeah, uh, it's certainly not the part. In fact, uh, the government, as opposed to really helping, quote-unquote, fight poverty, instead they subsidize it. And there's an important distinction there, because when you subsidize poverty or anything else, you create more of it. I think Ronald Reagan actually says something along those lines. He says a few pithy things every now and then. But, yes, they, they, they subsidize them. They don't try to empower them to bring themselves out of poverty, per se, they pay them because they're in poverty. And when you, when you pay someone, for instance, if you pay someone, let's say, the equivalent of $9 an hour for a full-time job, and they're out looking for other work, and they find an $11 hour job, well, they don't have the same incentive to work that job of $11 an hour. They're saying, is it worth two extra dollars an hour to work, to work 40 hours a week as opposed to getting less or $2 less an hour to not work at all? Exactly. You know, so you really, you really disrupt and distort the incentive structure there, and you know. And the other issue is the fact that, uh, and this is this is all empirical stuff. I, I like to stay in the realm of theory, but this is empirical stuff for those who like empiricism. Um, uh, I, I quoted a guy in the Journal of Libertarian Studies. I forget his name, but he he did some research and found that only about thirty percent, on average, of money that's that's uh, uh, funded for government welfare programs reaches its intended recipients, like the poor or what have you. Whereas in the private sector, it's exactly the inverse. It's 70% actually reaches it, where the 30% is absorbed through administrative costs and things like that. So that just kind of gives you an example of not only are you disturbing the incentive structures for people to get work, but you're also giving the t this task to people who don't have nearly as much of an incentive to do it as efficiently because they don't have any competitors, because their revenue is guaranteed, because they can force you to pay for the service. When they can force you to pay for their service, whether it's for charity or whatever else, they're not going to be nearly as incentivized to produce it as effectively as they would if they were in a free market with free competition. When I say free competition, I mean without their... Uh, um, with them being having to persuade people to purchase the service, not necessarily taking it from them against their will. And I think the final point is the fact that there's something called economic calculation, right? And, and economic calculation is enabled when you have an untainted pricing mechanism, which comes about through voluntary transactions. Basically, what I'm saying is that when you trade for goods and services with other people, you're bidding up or you're bidding down prices for various goods and services. And so these prices serve as a guide for other entrepreneurs and producers to know how to allocate their resources so they can satisfy the most amount of demands to the greatest degree. But when uh, you're an entity which takes money from people against their will, uh, you don't have any understanding if you're being efficient or not because they didn't voluntarily give this to you. They, they were forced to give it to you. So you have no means by which to know where, how can I most efficiently allocate these resources. It's like the socialism problem back in communist Russia, right? They didn't have a pricing mechanism, so they didn't know, they didn't have any way, way to understand what to produce or how to produce it or where to produce it or with what materials to produce. It. There's no way to gauge opportunity costs when you don't have this inviolable pricing mechanism. So even if you do, go ahead and give the states the benefit of the doubt that Okay, maybe it's just reform that we need. Maybe we just need better people in office with better hearts. Well, even then, it's still insufficient because they don't have access to an untainted pricing mechanism. You need voluntary transactions for it to come about. And you can't know what people want if you're making them pay and not allowing them to choose to pay. Because when they choose to pay, that's them demonstrating their preferences. When you're making them pay, you're just guessing at their preferences. So you don't have any objective indicator of them. And that's, and that's the bottom line there. Human action. Exactly. Human action. I love that. So, you know, what about the children? Do you hate the children? I mean, seriously, gee whiz. <laughs> well, that's, that's very interesting, too. Again, in my book, I like to stay more in the lines of economic theory and stuff, like the logical deductions from what we know about human action, human behavior, which all economic theory is based upon. Like, we know just by the nature of a voluntary exchange that – both parties must be better off at the time of its execution. Otherwise, they wouldn't have traded. So we know that to be true. Just no empirical thing can ever refute that. However, you know, for the sake of those people who prefer this stuff, I did look at some empirical evidence for this chapter. And one of the interesting things that I found was that um, a lot of the child labor, which was occurring during the Industrial Revolution, was already fading away 
before it was outlawed. And that makes sense because if they tried to outlaw it before it was um, before it was really superfluous, then there would have been a lot of outcry and outrage. And because children were working, not because you know uh, they're being coerced to doing it by greedy capitalists, but because they needed to bring extra income into the family so they could they could eat. You know, and parents, by and large, not all parents, but by and large, parents. If they have the practical option, they'll choose not to have their child work in the factories. They'd rather choose to have them stay at home and do the studies or develop themselves in other ways, right? And then what they showed is that when people make about you know twelve thousand or so dollars a year, they pretty much say, you know, I don't want you to work. I'll do all the work. You stay at home, and do your studies. So that stuff happens organically through the market. So yeah. after that stuff was already occurring, then the government comes in and legislates it away, and they take the credit for getting rid of the impetus for child labor, when in reality it was the market which set the means, which allowed them the practical ability to take their kids out of the factories and to go back to school or whatever else they needed to do. The same thing happened with the accidents in the workplace in OSHA. Um, exactly. Just a quick thing, you know, my dad would have been 70 years old this year, so when he was little, his dad got sick, and if um, minimum wage laws and child labor laws were there at the time, uh, his family would have starved. He started working yeah. when he was six years old and, mm -hmm. you know, put himself through school and helped the house. I mean, you know, whatever tiny things that he could do, you know, he was like a carrier. So he would like take the mail here and there and whatever little money, you know, to help his family. So right. I think that what you say is really important because it's not like we want to say, yeah, little kids need to go work and do this and that. But if their family is unable to afford food, and then the children are unable to work, you know, and they can, then, you know, a lot of things happen. A lot of things happen. And one of them is, you know, that you, you're uh, starving the family through that legislation. Uh, and number two, whenever um, the uh, children, even in a family that's not starving, you know, a family that is okay, you uh, uh, give the message that those children do not have anything to contribute to society. You know, they're right. too young, they're stupid, we don't want them until they turn 16, <laughs> right? So what about before, like little kids doing their lemonade stands? You know, my friend Colin had his little um, kids doing that too. And right. um, now you need to have a permit to do that kind of stuff. Yeah, crazy. That's extremely yeah. insane. And I think we need to really emphasize the fact that we're not making any sort of prescriptions here. We're not prescribing that children should go work. We're not saying uh, that some libertarians aren't greedy or libertarians are inherently greedy or not greedy. What we're saying is that for the children scenario, that they should have the freedom to work if they so choose. There should be a freedom of contract, of voluntary association, that if it's in their hearts to go work somewhere, why is it our place to stop them? We're not saying they must work. We're saying if they want to work, they should be allowed to. They shouldn't be legally disallowed to. And as far as like libertarians being greedy or sweet or whatever, I'm not here to say if libertarians are greedy or sweet. In fact, I'm sure there's many libertarians who are very sweet, and there are many libertarians who are the stereotypical greedy. The thing that does um, sort of universally apply to all of us, though, as far as our values and virtues, is that what makes us libertarian or what makes us an anarchist is that we're all universally against the initiation of physical violence against us and their property. That's what a libertarian is. And there are certain implications of that. You know, that's what's important to remember here. I love that. Um, I, I, in an interview with Doug Casey, he said, you know, the, the only two laws that really should exist, and not even laws, but, you know, social um, agreement is, you know, you should not initiate violence against people or their property. And number two, mm -hmm. Uh, you should do as uh, you have agreed to do. So basically follow your agreements and don't hurt others. And that's it. <laughs> right. Absolutely. You know, and, and, that's, and those are pretty much the precepts that any uh, uh, modern uh, civilization are founded upon. And insofar as those principles are degraded or, or perverted, uh, a society crumbles. You know? And again, because the state is inherently at odds with those principles, as, a state, as the state grows... Uh, uh, the stability of society sh starts to shake until it eventually erodes and implodes like the Roman Empire does. Like It seems like America and most of the Western civilization is about to under uh, 
the guise of central banking and, and further state intervention into the economy and our personal lives. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a telltale sign. You look throughout history and you see the same lesson being, uh, you know, put forth over and over again. So we just have to finally get to the point now to where we can really, this is why it's so exciting to live in this time because we, we finally have all the information available theoretically and, and fully of empirical data to see that, wow, the root of the issues in society are simple, yet they're pervasive. Yeah. And that's just the the pervasive use of the institutionalized initiation of force, whether by threat or by action, it's still there. And that's what states are. That's that's the crux of most of our issues. And once you let those go away, the market organically and beautifully is able to address these issues um, just better than we could ever even imagine. Because if you think about it, it's just the culmination of billions of minds working together, you know, and creating that spontaneous order. And no one, no, no central authority or, or director could ever emulate anything even close to that, ever. That's pretty sweet. Um, minimum wage, $11 nope. an hour. Yeah, you see, that's <laughs> that's another easy one. You know, it's it's so easy. And you'll when you, when you talk against the minimum wage, you'll have these people talk, say things like, "Well, I'll look at Sweden or look at some other country. They they raised their minimum wage, and unemployment didn't didn't shrink at all, or they were just fine." And you know, unfortunately, this is the issue with looking at things empirically as far as economics is concerned, is because they're not looking at things all are things equal. You know, for all you know the overall tax and regulatory burden could have been lessened, which counteracted the damaging effects of the minimum wage law. Or maybe the unemployment rate would have decreased even faster if it weren't there. The point is, is you have to understand a minimum wage law, all it's doing is it's prohibiting certain voluntary contracts. It's saying that person A wants a job, person B is offering a job for, let's say, $5 an hour, and he's willing to accept that job for $5 an hour, and the job that he's going to do is only going to produce about three dollars an hour worth of value, or I'm sorry, about seven dollars worth an hour of value. Well, not the minimum wage is ten dollars an hour. The employer can't offer this contract to him anymore because he can't deliberately pay someone more than he projects that they'll produce for him. To do that would be to generate losses and eventually go bankrupt, and that's bad for everyone. Yeah, that's what people don't understand, and and it's these very types of things which promote automation. Which the promotion of automation, it's fine unless it's brought about through uh, artificial means, like artificial interventions, like prohibiting people from contract. Because then you're bringing about kind of prematurely relative to what would happen in the market. So it destroys jobs. The prices of goods and services raise to kind of make up for the raise in wages they have to pay their workers. So it's more expensive for people to buy stuff. Now they have less money left over to buy other things. So their standard living goes down, unemployment rises. And you take away the bottom rungs of the economic ladder, which many of the, the youth and underprivileged uh, minorities or unskilled people used to rely upon. And you put them in a worse situation than they were beforehand, when in reality, you're actually trying to have this minimum wage law for their benefit. At least that's your ostensible purpose, right? Yeah. But they're the ones who get hurt the most by it. And it's just, it's, it's the most tragic thing. When you have a little bit of economic sense, you can see right through these lies. And I just think people are easily duped by these lies because they're relying upon their emotions, you know. These people should be paid more, but you don't look at the economic consequences and see that it's actually hurting them more. They'd rather be paid less than they'd be paid nothing at all because they can't find a job. And that's the bottom line. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, you know, everybody should have living wages. Jesus. <laughs> Yeah, and that's so arbitrary too. And again, uh, uh, the the dream or the idea of a living wage, you know, that, that's that's wonderful and grand. But I think before living wages, they want some wage at all. Right? <laughs> they can't have any wage at all if no one's willing to offer them a job because they they can't afford this minimum wage. You know. I mean, I don't know about you, but I you know I started uh, working at a Dickie's barbecue for like seven dollars an hour. So, you know, and this just starting there and moving up. And, yeah, I worked at McDonald's. I worked at McDonald's, I worked at Sonic's. I, I used to flip burgers. You know, I said, do you want fries with that? You know, <laughs> <laughs> I had uh, bad groceries. Yeah. And, you know, here's the other unfortunate thing is that, you know, there is a certain grain of truth in the fact of how the working class is kind of exploited nowadays. Because, honestly, uh, 
taking the entrepreneurial path and not the wage labor path would be much more feasible in a free market because there wouldn't be so much so many barriers to it. You know, a lot of people nowadays are uh, much more funneled into wage type of positions yeah. because there's so many barriers to creating your own business, paying your own taxes, so many liability things. It's much more risky in this environment. Uh, you need all these permits and licensures, and there's IP laws you have to watch out for. And then you have to pay your workers the minimum wage and cover their insurance and all that jazz and you know keep up your records to the IRS. I mean, there's just so many additional costs the government placed upon starting your own business that would never exist under a free market that would make these alternatives much more feasible. So if you're really against wage labor and you're all for everyone having their own business, the free market once again is the answer. It makes doing that much more simple. And that. if you don't want to do that, then work in a cooperative. There's nothing incompatible with cooperatives and free markets either. Work in a cooperative. I mean, that's the point is that a free market doesn't say you have to be a wage laborer and work in an institution that's set up in a hierarchical way. It's just saying, hey, as long as you're doing things voluntarily, as long as you're working with goods that you originally appropriated or received through voluntary exchange, then you can do what you want with them. You can create communes. You can create cooperatives. You can create corporations. It doesn't matter. It's your purpose. <laughs> Exactly. We're not going to stop you. And then we'll see. The market will show which one's more efficient. <laughs> right? I love that. I love that. Um, we're running uh, a little low on time. So I just want to say thank you so much for uh, agreeing to be here. Hopefully it's not the last time. Um, Please. Absolutely. We can, we can uh, shoot the shit a little more some other time. And um, you, are, you have a baby coming. So I want to like uh, publicly public publicly say uh, congratulations and I love you too and three rather with the little guy coming so yeah. anything that you would like to add last minute of the interview sir uh, that's all I have I just want to say it's been a true pleasure of mine and I do look forward to being in your show in the future and uh, keep an eye out for my book I'll be posting about it on Facebook from here on out and uh, if you want to see some of my videos I've already made you can go ahead and go to uh, youtube.com slash ancapchase that's A-N-C-A-P-C-H-A-S-E thank you and you again you have your Facebook and uh, if you send me your links we'll put them down here uh, okay. whenever we publish this so thank you so much and thank you all of you for um Another awesome interview with Ancap Chase. And he's going back to Asheville. So I'll see That's you there. That's right. Have a That's great right. one. You too, Luis. Peace. Peace. Love and anarchy.